We start. Yep, we may start. Okay. 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 So, uh, a good welcome to everybody this afternoon to this third in the series of working on what works in homeopathy. Um, real case studies in practice is, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank um, the Faculty of Homeopathy and the Tuckles Compass for this collaboration. Um, and we will be running a series of these um, webinars over the coming uh, next 18 months, two years. Um, so look out for information, you'll be contacted on, on these things. Um, so, uh, I would like today to present a case to you of uh, Lyme disease that uh, actually is a case that is an ongoing case, actually. Um, but I wanted to show some of the difficulties encountered with such, uh, such a condition. So. Um, We'll, uh, we'll start off, um, share my screen. Perhaps I'll talk a little bit about um, Lyme disease first. Some of you may not be familiar with this condition. Uh, let me share this. Okay. So, um, this is a book I uh, have been recently looking at, and you may be interested to uh, investigate this. Um, very interesting uh, book written by a, a journalist who um, also was very badly affected, her and her husband, by Lyme disease um, in America. And so she started to investigate the whole condition um, accordingly because she got no help whatsoever um, because it's a disease that only until recently has really been recognized or admitted that that really exists. So I think they tried to uh, mm, cover certain things up for a long time, and it may be due to some of the things that she uncovered in this uh, story. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about it, but anyway, um, and it may it may be a factor in why this uh, disease has become such an epidemic, uh, especially in America, but it's widespread now in Europe. Um, Lyme disease um, finally was, uh, the, the organism isolated was Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, which is a bacterial species known as a spirochete. Um, since all Borrelia species are host propagated bacteria that move between a vertebrate host and tick vector, the spirochetes have developed strategies to sense and survive in these diverse environments. So survival is achieved by altering the level of gene expression uh, in response to changes in temperature, pH, salts, nutrient content, and you know, multiple host and vector dependent factors. So really it is a very individual response to the, to the disease and the, the organism. Um, this, this spirochete is known as a persister bacteria uh, in, in biology, so that they're difficult to eradicate from the system. They stay and get into the system and, and eradication is very difficult and a defense has to be mounted in order to try to defend against these things. Um, and that defense, of course, we, we help by stimulating the organism with, uh, with homeopathy. Uh, antibiotics are only partially successful in treating this infection as the spirochete is very cl uh, clever and adept at adapting to hostile environments. So it seems that antibiotics are successful in roughly if used very early on in roughly 50%, 55, 60% of 
of cases if treated in the initial stages. Um, usually it's doxycycline, amoxicillin, um, metronidazole and tyanidazole, the five, four, four or five drugs commonly used. Neither of these studied drugs was able to reduce the spirochete colony formation more than 50%. So despite their use, the spirochete remains in the system and can affect the person later on. So we've got a condition that is like a post-infective condition that affects something like Two million Americans now. It's a chronic condition that um, uh, breaks down the organism. Um, medicine realizes that there are genetic factors from the hosts that come into play in the in the severity and persistence of the illness. We know that it depends on our level of health uh, and our, our miasmatic history. Uh, I'll talk a bit about this. The gene expression, as they call it, and the ability of these bacteria to change this expression. So something I realized a while ago was that this spirochetes, the, the, the better known disease with spirochete as a cause is syphilis. Now syphilis is a, um, a, a quite a similar type of disease. It has three stages to it, as does Lyme disease. So it struck me have the similarity between syphilis and Lyme is quite strong. You've got an, a, a, an initial stage, which is um, on the skin. Uh, and then it starts to go into the muscular system. And then the third stage is, is neurological into the central nervous system, as does syphilis. Also syphilis is treatable with penicillin, uh, as is uh, Lyme disease, somewhat. So it seems to me that there's a link between these um, conditions. Um, so we would put it in a syphilitic bracket. Um, the first stage is a skin presentation. So with Lyme, it's a, it's a, a kind of um, what they call bullseye eruption. So is, is the first sign of it. And then it starts to go, uh, I'll explain, into deeper areas, if not treated. Now, both diseases are actually called the great imitator. Syphilis was called this, and also Lyme, so that it's uh, in its chronic stages can imitate all sorts of other diseases, including, including neurological diseases. Um, but actually the origin is from the, the initial infection. Um, Lyme was only fairly recently recognized as a real syndrome. Um, despite the first outbreak, real outbreak where it was recognized was 1968 in, in a place in Lyme, Connecticut in the States. Um, and it was mistaken for many other diseases. Tests were unreliable. The test still isn't very reliable. Um, and it wasn't until 1981 that a Swiss German um, researcher, biologist, uh, came to the United States and isolated the spirochete that's responsible. Uh, he was called Willy Bergdorfer. Um, now over half a million Americans contract Lyme every year. As I said, there's well over 2 million who suffer with post-Lyme disease syndrome. But what's not well known is this, this book here, um, is that actually he was enlisted into the American germ warfare program in, in, in the 60s that had started after the Second World War. And this research was um, taking place uh, during the Cold War to try and find organisms that they could use to uh, drop onto the Russians. Uh, and they, they wanted to use ticks as a means, as a delivery system. So he was researching the way you could um, mutate ticks, 
and manipulate them so that they carried various nasty pathogens. And they were researching this in, uh, in America and doing tests with it. So they were uh, dropping these infected ticks over large areas to see who was getting in, uh, affected and various animals that they were trying to infect. And so obviously these things got loose uh, into the into the environment. And so it seems that uh, and a lot of it was covered up and uh, until finally, just before his death, he confessed uh, what was happening and um, that actually this is what was what was the case. Um, so it seems that the, the Lyme disease is not uh, just a natural disease anymore. Um, so this is what's making it so, uh, so difficult, I think. And this was trying to mix all sorts of pathogens from Lyme to uh, another disease called uh, rickettsia um, and all sorts of things with botulism and nasty pathogens they were trying to mix up. And it happened to coincide with this first outbreak of the tick-borne disease in the 60s. So, and it's something that has been tried to be covered up for a long time, I think, because of its origins. So the, initially the rash comes as a bullseye rash, so you know, like a ring at the center. And then you start to get, typically with, with Lyme's flu-like flu symptoms, fever, aches, chills swollen glands. Um, then after some days or even some weeks, headaches, neck stiffness, then arthritis is a particular arthritic syndrome that came from it, muscle pains, fatigue, palpitations, breathlessness, and even paralysis, Bell's palsy. Um, and then months or years later, if, if left untreated, Neurological symptoms, ataxia, severe vertigo, insomnia, reduction of mental faculties, dullness, forgetfulness, uh, difficulty processing information, and then cardiac problems. And there have been quite a few deaths from uh, this condition reported. So it's a serious condition, one maybe not um, understood very well, especially in Europe still. Um, so we'll We'll have a look at it at this case, and I think it can be mistaken for different diseases, even, even a lot of conditions that might be considered chronic fatigue, ME, things like that, that might have their origin in, in, in a tick bite. So it's always worth asking if people have had any kind of infection. Um, so going on to my case, as I said, it's actually ongoing, but um, this was, um, I first saw this gentleman in September last year, a 63 year old male. Um, his symptoms actually started in the March last year, um, but he didn't do anything about it. Um, and finally I saw him in the September. He didn't actually tell me um, about the Lyme infection initially. That didn't come out till later. So I had no clue at the beginning what I was dealing with. Um, so his presenting symptoms, by the time I saw him was he had, and this had been going on for months, he had these tremendous chills happening uh, most of the time, but worse in the evenings. Uh, so he was wearing five or six layers, tremendous shivering and chills, no fever whatsoever, just chills. So it was like a <clears throat> remittent, what might be remittent chills. So they, they would die down a bit and then come up, but never any temperature. Uh, the other strange thing was tremendous sensitivity of the of the skin. So um, he was unable to have the skin touched. So it was like, you know, if you're familiar with sometimes with flu where the skin becomes 
ultra sensitive to touch to the nerve endings. This was all over the legs and the torso. Very, very sensitive, almost unbearable. Um, Andrew, sorry to interrupt. Can, can we see your screen so we can see the symptoms? Yes, we... sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I'll do that now. Okay, thank you. Uh, where are we? Sharing screens. So, um, yes. You can see this? Uh, no, we still yeah. see the book. Okay, new share. Um, you, you may stop sharing and then start sharing again. That's it. Now it's okay. You can see your screen now. Okay, thank you. Um, see, initially, these are the symptoms I put in. Um, he had night sweats, also tremendous night sweats, fatigue extreme fatigue. He was a very active man um, and he was unable to do anything, absolutely exhausted. As I say, worse in the evenings, muscle pains. He had a cough. Uh, initially, of course, at the, at the current time, I thought maybe this was some kind of COVID thing you know, post long COVID or I, I, it was a bit of a mystery to me. Um, so I was treating it almost like an acute at first. Now this has been going on for months. Um, loss of appetite, some nausea, very, very thirsty, the cold water. So despite the, the tremendous chills, very, very thirsty for cold water. He was drinking up to six liters a day. So feeling very dehydrated. And also any, any exertion was uh, aggravating the chills and the coldness. So he, he wasn't able to do anything, even if he wanted to, starting to feel worse. Um, generally wanting to be alone. That's why he'd spent so long, he just thought he could deal with it himself. Um, so he um, he told me that he, he had some remedies. He took Bryony himself, it's the first thing he'd done, but it had no effect whatsoever. So uh, these are the symptoms that I took initially with uh, Compass. Um, we got thirst, he was sweating, chill after exertion, profuse night sweats, the sensitive skin, uh, the evening aggravation time, the exertion that was aggravating him and then the cold water. So you have this interesting symptom here, if you know the remedy with one of the main remedies for this, but Wanting cold water during a chill is quite a strange thing. We can see here. This is very typical of a remedy, Eupatorium perforatum. They, when they have their chills, they want cold water, which is a peculiar symptom. Bryona also, so, and Dolkamara. Oops. Um, so, yes, yeah, so and here we have, he wanted, some, he wanted cold milk as well, salty things. He but had no appetite really and, and tremendous weakness during the chill. So um, this was the initial repertorization and uh, results we can see here, of course, Eupatorium coming up very strongly. We can see here, which symptoms relate to Eupatorium in our case. In here in red, you see the main one coming up here, the strangest symptom in the case here and the exertion. Um, and then we have calc carb, 
Phosphorus tuberculinum bionem. So I initially, considering the state of weakness and night sweats, I initially gave him tuberculinum um, in a 200C potency. Uh, and uh, the result of that was that he just had basically, he just felt worse in, in all ways. There was no improvement after it. Um, however, the night sweat stopped. So there was an improvement of one symptom. So this is not the right remedy. And his chills and shiveriness around the trunk and torso were excessively strong. Soreness of the skin to touch. Wrapping up constantly with layers of clothes, trying to keep warm, but having no effect really. He would want hot baths all the time just to try to keep warm. Strong nausea in the afternoon. Thirst against, they're still very strong for the cold things. Let me, um, yeah. And very chilly, but still wanting the cold water. His, uh, his, his, in terms of levels of health, his history was that he hadn't had any history of acute with high fever for a very long time, years. So of course this tells us that um, his general level of health is, is low. So we're looking at something quite chronic and his ability to, to recover is, uh, is gonna be more difficult. Probably will put him in, in, in the levels of health category in group three. Um, so this is going to make the case more difficult. It's not as clear usually in this in these groups. The remedy is not as clear. The reactions aren't as clear in their effects, or well, they don't last as long. We have to take these things into account. So um, so symptoms, no effects, so a next analysis I used Just pared it down a bit to less symptoms to the main ones. Um, so the second repertorization We've got the thirst, the chill from exertion, sensitiveness, weakness, cold drinks. So we see the results. And I gave him the second time, decided to give the Eupatorium because it was, a, um, it was well indicated. It was a remedy he could get was, um, in, in the country he was in. So again, uh, this was Eupatorium 30C with no general effect on his symptoms. So he started to um, also develop a bit more nausea and a, and a strong empty feeling in the stomach with a need to eat but not really wanting to eat. No appetite, fatigue was tremendous. Um, and really wanting, getting slight relief from hot baths. So this was the next thing. Um, and um, what I did after this is um, on a, a different repertorization, but I won't show it at this point, but it was, I decided um, to give him Rustox. And then if that didn't help Nux Vomica um, due to his um, relief from the hot bathing, both in 200 C, neither of them had any, any real effect. Um, so, uh, 
At this point, I was trying to understand the um, pathology of what was going. I still didn't know at this point about the Lyme. Um, this was, I was thinking, is this a prolonged flu? Flus don't usually take this long. Was it some kind of COVID syndrome? Um, it almost seemed like a kind of malaria, the way it was coming and you know, slightly relapsing and then, and then it had been going on so long. Um, these chills are getting worse in the evening. There was a, so there was a periodicity to it. What we would, we would say that's a bit like a malaria type condition, which we see in things like malarial rickettsia. Um, so all the, these types of diseases are parasitical in origin. Um, so I was thinking about this and then asked him, and this is when I asked him about the Lyme, and he said, oh yes, he remembered being bitten earlier in the year and he had the rash, but he didn't do anything about it. So he had no treatment. So he then went, he went and had a Lyme test and they discovered it came up positive. So this was giving us some information then that this was the origin of his problem, probably, most likely. And possibly this, this could have been what um, Bergdorfer, he described there was a, a peculiar thing that had been suppressed in America in all the reports, and it was something he called Swiss agent. A Swiss agent was a type of um, tick-borne disease that was discovered in Switzerland. Um, so it was uh, Rickettsia uh, helvetica. Um, and he discovered in the blood tests of the victims that there was, a, there was both Lyme, Borrelia and Rickettsia, so he called it Swiss agent. And then he started to investigate this, this as, a, as a use for a biological weapon. <clears throat> so it may be in Europe that this type of Lyme condition is a mixture of these conditions. Rickettsia is quite a, a nasty disease as well. Um, So on, under this light, I started to think that this was a, a case of Lyme. And looking at the symptoms again, with the thirst, the coldness, the chill is so extreme. And then it struck me, I thought I'll look at the, you know, the, the strange rare and peculiar of this case. We, we always need to try and look at the, what's outstanding in the case, what's strange. And, for me, one of the strangest things was that he had these chills, but with no fever, there was no heat. And these were long lasting. This had been going on for some months and nothing relieves him. There's no relief from anything. It doesn't matter if he has fires, clothes, heaters, it stays. So we see here, an interesting symptom, chill, shaking, rigors, long lasting, not relieved by anything. This seemed to me to be exactly the symptom. And you see here chill, warmth, desire for, which does not relieve. So these symptoms we can find by doing searches in, um, in Compass. Um, and um, <clears throat> I'll show you also how to, to see the Materia Medica. Um, skin sen sensitiveness, sore feeling, and then the, the, cold, the cold water again. So this time, it's not such a dissimilar result from last time, but <coughs> I was looking, we're seeing Arania coming up here, Arania diadema. Not a remedy I was very familiar with. Um, and uh, we can see here this symptom. The symptoms of Arania here, 
pretty much match what he has. Nux Formica again, of course, which he'd taken with no, no relief. So we see here Rania in third degree. No relief from warmth whatsoever. So um, I thought, well, let's. I had. I wasn't familiar with this remedy, Arania diadema. You can see if you want to see the material meadow, you can go here on in the repertorization and just we'll show you. So Arania is one of our uh, spider venom remedies. Uh, we have several we, we know of, um, you know, like tarantula and um, mygali is another one. And Arania is the papal cross spider. Now, if you go and look this up on uh, online, most of them say the papal cross spider is, is uh, harmless to humans. <laughs> Not exactly. Um, so we see here. This, most of this, this comes from Burica. Um, Alan has information, but there's not a lot. There was a couple of provings done. Uh, the original one here that Burica uses was from a person called Van Grauvogel, I don't know if that's pronounced right in the mid 19th century. So contemporary of Hahnemann actually, Van Grovogel did a first proving and this is based mainly based on this. Um, <clears throat> and we see that this remedy has a lot of the characteristics of this case. Periodicity. So again, we're almost looking at a malarial type situation and indeed it's been used in that condition, periodicity, coldness, and dampness, susceptibility to dampness, remedy, favorable to malarial poisoning, chilliness. Patient feels cold to the very bones, coldness not relieved by anything. So this is his situation. Uh, feeling as if parts were enlarged. This is another keynote that he doesn't have, but I, that's how I've used it, I think, once before, I remember, with somebody who felt that their hands were much larger than they actually were, especially at night. They wake up as if they've got double hands. This is, it's a, it's a delusion, of course. They're not swollen, but they feel like they're enlarged. They hands twice their size. Feeling. Uh, hydrogenoid constitution, so we would think of this as um, psychotic miasm, so abnormal sensitiveness to dampness and coldness, like that self. Um, we see some various symptoms here. Coldness. Chilly day and night. Um, so, and I can show you another way to try and find, I find this very useful feature of Compass that I use a lot when you want to um, find some information about the remedy. You go here when you're doing a search, select the remedy. And then here you can you can select specific chapters or even degrees or rubric sizes, which I've shown before, um, to try to narrow down into a, like an essence of the remedy. But here, just to show what symptoms there are in the repertory, you can just search and very quickly you get the, uh, the symptoms, all the symptoms of Arania in the repertory. And of course, if you, if you set it up to show um, hierarchically third degree rem uh, symptoms first, you'll see 
like an essence of the remedy, it's, its most characteristic features. So you see here, there's a tremendous focus on chilliness, periodicity. Chill, predominating, long lasting, without heat, perspiration or thirst. <laughs> he has thirst, but you see the idea, long lasting months, this has been going on, with no fever. See, without heat, the, he the fever phase never comes, not relieved by anything, without subsequent heat. So, violent chills, warmth, desire does not relieve, intermittent, lack of vital need, lassitude, you see the, the, the exhaustion. Mentally, we don't have much information, just says morose, um, headaches, and uh, various nausea, emptiness, symptoms that he had, and then the extreme, the coldness of the extremities, numbness, swelling, chill, now we're down to the second degree. Uh, symptoms. So we've got chill after exposure, periodicity clock-like. So this is like another remedy that has tremendous periodicity is Cedron. Some of you may know Cedron, which has conditions that appear exactly the same time of day. 2 p.m. headaches every day. For instance, so we've got, uh, here we are, shaking, chills, long lasting, 24 hours without heat, same symptom, cold aggravates, etc. And here we have some symptoms, confusion, parts of the body enlarged, etc. So it goes on. So there's quite a lot of symptoms there with Arrhenia. But um, to get the, the main ones, here we see it's the chill and the coldness. So this helps a lot in identifying the, the remedy. So I decided to give Aranya in a 200C. And... Um, So the first follow-up to that was on the 8th of December. Um, and contrary to all the other remedies that had no real effect, after this he had one dose, he had a big aggravation of all his symptoms, so it became worse. More shivery chills, even worse for 12 hours, and then the symptoms started to improve. First, uh, his legs and thighs, and then the soreness, the sensitiveness from that area went, and then it started to recede everywhere. Then the torso, he was left with a very sensitive scalp. Um, and also uh, a left-sided headache. The fatigue had improved a lot. The coldness was much better, so he was not needing so much uh, heat. The pains were much better. Um, the appetite was slightly better. So of course we would wait at this point. Um, good response after initial aggravation followed by a gradual improvement. We like to see this. Um, the second follow-up came on the 20th of December. He reported a very strong headache on the left hand side that then moved over to the right. So, a nice symptom, which we know is a keynote of Lachesis. So, I told him to take a dose of Lachesis 200, and he took this, and the headache went. 
Now, after this, it starts to get a bit complicated um, because he, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, he, at Christmas, I lost touch with him a little bit. And at Christmas, he, he then developed this tremendous rash on his legs. So all his symptoms had improved. And then this rash came up on the legs, very red, uh, almost like an erysipelas type rash, very itchy. Um, and he panicked and went to the doctor. It was in, in France. And the doctor told him that it was psoriasis, which I really don't understand, um, and gave him a cream to put on it and a kind of foam, he said, to clean it, antiseptic. So this, this he did, and then immediately the rash calmed down and uh, he got edema in his uh, legs, his feet and ankles, it swelled up. Um, however, his other symptoms were all better. But then they started to relapse slightly when he did the skin thing. So I told him to take the Arania 200 again, which then his general symptoms improved again. However, he panicked again because the rash was still there and, and the edema of the legs was there. And then he, he took himself off to a hospital there um, after Christmas. And of course, uh, in hospitals, as we know, they, they, they go to town with all the tests and the drugs. So he was put on to with the, looking at his legs, steroids and antibiotics and blood tests. And they um, said there was some kind of kidney function irregularity. So uh, I think this is always a bit of a danger if we're not in contact with the patient constantly in these cases, and especially if they're in another country, is that if people then go and do these things, which of course he was worried, the suppressive effect, I believe the, the rash was part of the progression of the treatment, because he was so much better. But then the suppression of that immediately brings possibly a kidney problem and, uh, with edema. Um, so, the latest I've heard from him, which was yesterday, he's out of hospital. And uh, thankfully, from my point of view, the rash has come back. It's tremendously itchy, so I've told him just to leave it, do not treat it. Uh, the swelling is now down, but I don't know if that is due to the steroids. But all his other symptoms are good. So he's feeling better, but now he has this very, very, very itchy rash on his legs. So this is where, where we're at at the moment, but it's, it's good to present this kind of case because it's not finished. And sometimes patients do these things in panic and, um, and it interferes in the case, you see, and it's potentially dangerous to suppress such a rash. Um, so, what are we doing for time? Yes. Um, I know there are some questions here. Where does that come up? You can look at some questions in a minute. Um, um, yes, so this is a case that's ongoing, um, and um, I think it shows how difficult it can be sometimes. I think the diagnosis helped um, for us to understand the type of case it was, and then to, in, in, to understand the type of condition and the seriousness of it. Um, Lyme, I have treated Lyme before in quite a few cases, but mainly 
a lot of it is much, is is simpler, but sometimes the cases get very complex. So um, we need to be careful. Um, and again, it, this shows is quite a small remedy. Um, not very well known. There's not very much information on it. Um, as I say, we only have Boroka. Um, so, yes. Let's see some questions. Hello, hello, hello. The question is, uh, Adriel, is uh, what would happen if Lachis is not given and Arania repeated? Uh -huh. What would have happened? Ah, that's a good one. We don't know, do we? Um, we can't know that, it's true. Um, but it was a very obvious... Um, the, the headache he had was tremendous. I mean, it was so strong. He said, oh, you have to do something. I'm going to take painkillers. And he couldn't bear it. So, and it was very clearly left to right. So I think, I think it was something we had to do. And after this, he did develop the rash. So I think this is a good progression. Um, but uh, of course, the suppression with the creams meant he needed to repeat the Arania afterwards. But as to what might have happened, we'll never know, really. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, another question is, uh, do you consider Lyme disease as incurable even by classical homeopathy? No, I've had cases that I would consider cured, but um, as in people, they recover and don't have any more symptoms. Uh, of course, as I said, the, the what they call the colony of the spirochetes seems to remain in the body. So whether it's ever totally cured is another matter. I think the, the patients that go on um, with chronic Lyme, it's, it's quite difficult to totally cure them sometimes. Um, it's a good, another question I was asked is, would you take antibiotics? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, it's such a serious illness that I would be tempted to say, um, if you have that opportunity in the beginning, you know you have, you've had the bullseye rash, probably on balance it might be a, a good idea to take them initially because it appears to work in a high percentage of the cases and it's not worth risking the consequences. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you have a clear homeopathic remedy, then you can give this. Um, but it's it's a really nasty disease, so it's a difficult one. I wouldn't blame people for taking the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, okay, can you show again the symptoms of Arania? I don't know if they want the symptoms of the case. Can you show, please, again the symptoms of the case and then the symptoms in general. These ones? Okay. Yes. These are the symptoms. Mm -hmm. These are around yeah. Yes. I think there was a question about grading um, and, and the importance, which is yes, very important in compass to to put put correct grading in um, in the symptoms. It makes a difference, of course. Um, but the system will, will bring up the remedy anyway, even if you put the wrong grading in. So that's the beauty of the system. It won't disappear from, this, from the result. Mm -hmm. uh, they want and all the symptoms, Farania, uh, the, the extraction of the rubrics. Extraction. Yes. This one. The, this one, yes. Thank you. I think this was the crucial 
matching symptom. Because I've, I've never seen such a, a type of chill before when nothing relieves it. And it lasts for months. It's a very strange thing. It must be some, I think this relates to these parasite type illnesses, which may be put into a malarial type category where they persist in the bloodstream and recur and recur and recur. Um, so Naxomaka is a good thought in, in the case. He was quite an irritable man. Stomach problems, emptiness, all this, but it had no effect. And uh, so we need to think of these small remedies sometimes. Okay, another question is, do you plan a preventive, in quotes, homeopathic treatment if you have a clear homeopathic remedy that works for your patients, uh, I mean giving the remedy once a month, for example. As a preventative. As a preventive remedy, yes. No. No. In, in uh, acute situations or chronic, does they mean? I think they mean chronic. Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. no, no, no. Never, I would never give something preventatively like that. I mean, giving a, a constitutional remedy, if you like, is a preventative, but you don't need to keep repeating it only if, the, if they start to relapse, you know. Mm -hmm. I seem to have success with uh, 2,000 2, milligrams deoxycycline uh, at onset of bull's eye as prophylactic, as prophylactic uh, measure. Deoxycycline, the, the antibiotic. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was there a question with them? As a comment. Okay. So what triggered the formation of rash? Lachesis or Arania? It was after the Lachesis that the rash came. Um, but I don't know if it was due to the Lachesis or due to the effect of the Arania coming through. I, I, I guess it was probably the effect of the Arania um, because all his symptoms had improved and then the rash came out. So I think the Lachesis was more like an acute prescription for the headache. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was based on pretty much on one symptom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, another question is, uh, what is the difference between VEST system and, and COMBAS? I, I can answer this question. Uh, uh, Vifulka's COMBAS was made lately, and the difference with VEST is that, is that it is based on a large quantity of QRKs, that is, to calibrate the system, the brain, a, a large number of QR cases, mostly for uh, Professor Vifulka's archive, was taken into account. So we can say it uses newer technology and um, it is, I may, I may say, more precise than VES, which is an older uh, system. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. Um, Okay. 24 hours follow up. This is, a, I don't know what this questions, question mean. No. H how long was the follow up? How long? Uh, I, I, I think that the, 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 he asks about uh, when should be the follow-up in acute cases. Uh, I don't know, something like this. Uh -huh. I mean, in this case, the follow-ups were when 
when he contacted me, but uh, um, in acute cases, it depends how, how acute the situation is. But if it's in like COVID acute, then we're in touch with people every day um, because the, 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 the symptoms change so often. So we need to be in touch daily with acute cases, very acute cases. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, here's the symptom. I had three clients with Lyme, same family, all treated with antibiotics, one left with a mixture of complex symptoms, two with ME type symptoms, one dropped out of treatment, the other two had complete recovery. Yeah. Yeah, that's about right. Probably two thirds will recover with the antibiotics, but um, one third won't and, and get left with quite a complex disease. It's true, it's not easy. Um, I know someone who used bee venom successfully to treat Lyme. Huh. Is that bee venom? being stung or apis, I wonder. Um, do you warn, this is a question, do you warn people about the possibility of rashes appearing and the importance of not suppressing them? Uh, usually I do. Uh, this, this one, I didn't have a chance because he, I, didn't, I didn't find out about it until he'd already done it. Unfortunately, he didn't, you know, he didn't, um, tell me so it wasn't something that I was necessarily expecting to happen as a with a rash but it's true we should warn people of all the possibilities uh, so that we can avoid them doing these things or at least tell them to contact us first um, yeah uh, encompass there are four grades for symptom gradings, but we very rarely we see the fourth gradation in repertorizations. That's true. Yes, the fourth degree is a very, very high, strong, very, very strong and, and uh, characteristic symptom we would use. For instance, in his case, you could put this chill in, in the fourth degree. Um, so this one. We could put it up to, oh, yeah, wouldn't want us to change it. Okay. But you could put this up to fourth because it was such a strong symptom. It's true, we don't see so many um, entries in the repertory within fourth degree. Um, certainly there are none under this remedy. Um, <clears throat> so, do we have any other questions? Uh, I treated a 12 year old with Leiden onset on bullseye last summer. So far, no symptoms, but could be dormant. Yeah, we, the problem with that is we, you never know if the patient would have been all right or not when we give Leiden. It's almost like a preventative, but we can't tell whether they would have developed any symptoms. So, it's hard to say. Uh, I know the idea from insect bites, but um, and leadum is you know is is a is a remedy you would think of in the in the early stages, but um, we still have to go on the symptoms really. But um, initially, the symptoms are just this uh, rash. So I'm not aware of there's a remedy that has specifically has this bullseye rash. If anyone knows that. That, that, that a remedy has produced this type of rash. Also, the, I think the remedies like Arania, they need reproving because it's a very, it's a very small proving that was done on about four people. And um, they've really not had proper full provings. So to bring out the mental symptoms. I know somebody mentioned a book here about spider things, but the trouble is, Without, without approving, we can't really confirm 
the symptoms. You know, somebody may have had some cases and they say these are the mental symptoms, but we don't know if really it belongs to the remedy. Um, so we need to redo these provings. Okay. Um, uh, is Arania layer formed since the tick bite? Yes. And, uh, and another question is, do you see changes on mental level after Arania? Yeah, he didn't really, I wouldn't say he really had any mental issues. It was all physical. I wouldn't say there's been any change really in him, but he, he, he didn't have any mental pathology from it. I mean, obviously, he, he, after six months, he was feeling pretty, uh, not very good uh, in such a state. He was a bit down. Um, so obviously, with the symptoms improving, he'll feel better, but not really. Um, Okay, and the other question is that if the arana layer formed since the tick bite. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Myasmatic background in Lyme disease. Yeah, I think as they probably missed what I said at the beginning, but I would say um, due to its, its nature of the, the three stages of Lyme's, it, it mimics or it's possibly a kind of uh, child of syphilis, <laughs> so a syphilitic background, I would say. Um, um, definitely, it seems to me that the spirochete with syphilis, it's, it's an aspect of it that very similar to with Lyme. So we need to be looking at those types of remedies. And uh, also we see with Arania that it's, it's it's a psychotic remedy with this sensitivity to dampness. So it's probably, Arania is a psychotic remedy, but maybe this disease fits in between syphilis and psychosis. Um, but the way it goes into the nervous system, I would say um, syphilitic. Um, but in terms of treatment of that, um, nothing specific, you just have to, to, to follow and give the correct uh, similimum at the time to, uh, to treat. In treating myasins, it's not that you have to give nosodes um, only if they're indicated. So you're treating a myasin by giving two or three remedies in correct order and succession, and then the, that miasmatic layer is, is uh, eradicated. That's the way we do it. In classical homeopathy, um, nothing is specific for those things. He would have to be exhibiting, you know, syphilinum symptoms to give syphilinum. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we don't have any other uh, question, I think we can conclude. Okay, yes, yes, thank you everyone for uh, mm -hmm. attending. I hope it's been uh, of interest and um, it certainly uh, made me think about some small remedies. And um, um, I hope you will, uh, attend uh, the next one and thank you very much to uh, the Talkus Compass and to the Faculty of Homeopathy for hosting this. We thank you very much uh, Andrew for this fantastic presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have this uh, email if you want to contact us. The email you see on the screen. And uh, okay, bye bye. And we wish you all the best.